So I want to speak tonight on the power of friendship. And we're going to look at two quick passages in John's Gospel, uh, both of which are when Jesus has what's called the Last Supper, his final meal, uh, before he goes to the cross. First John 13 at verse 21. Jesus, after he'd said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple, motioned to this disciple and asked, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Jesus, Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the mill understand why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas had charged on the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now if the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I now tell you where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then we continue the conversation in John 15, a little bit further on at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I want to speak tonight on the power of friendship. We're continuing our series, follow, looking at what it means to follow Jesus, to be Jesus' apprentice, to be his disciple, to be someone who seeks to follow Jesus. And one of the keys to following Jesus is this whole idea of friendship. One of the fascinating things about how Jesus leads us and how we're called to follow him is that we're called to follow him as his friends. And our relationships with each other, our friendships, have a huge significance in our spiritual journey. And the first thing we see in these passages is that you need friends. It's fascinating. This key moment in Jesus' life, this key crisis moment just before he goes to the cross. He's about to die. And what does he do with his final hours, with his last few hours of life? He gathers his closest friends for a meal and spends time with them. He wants his closest friends round the table with them. His close friends, his companions, you know the word companions, comes from compagnie, with bread. Your companions are those you break bread with, the people you get round the table and break bread with. And Jesus, in his final hours, invests his time in his companions. Now, I, good question to ask yourself if you like playing these games. If you're going to die tomorrow and you had a last supper tonight, who would you invite? Who'd be on your list? You know, who would, who would, you, who would you invite? Because you might, you might not know. Some of us find it sometimes a little bit difficult to answer that question. And if you find it difficult, then this might be a time in your life you need to invest a bit more intentionally in your companions, in the people you break bread with. Aristotle said it takes 10 bags of salt to find a friend. Because friendship is formed by eating together. It's formed by wasting time on each other. And at this moment, Jesus needed his close friends. Actually, one of the most important skills in life is finding, forging, and keeping great friends. Because friendships don't necessarily have a survival value, but they're one of the things that give value to survival. They enrich every aspect 
of life. Friends multiply joys and they divide sorrows. And studies show that the quality of your friendships directly impacts your resilience, it impacts your capacity to absorb pressure, to face challenges life brings. And that's true even on a physiological level. I was reading uh, recently a meta-study of 148 different independent uh, medical research papers, you know, like you do on a, on a Friday night. And, um, and it, one of the things that they show is that the quality of your friendship impacts your body even on a cellular level to an extent equivalent to whether or not you smoke or whether or not you drink. It can increase your protection from disease. It can decrease the likelihood of you facing an acute stress response. The quality of your friendship even reduces the likelihood of you catching a cold. So if you've got a cold tonight, it doesn't mean you've got rubbish friends. You know, sometimes it just happens. And yet there's lots about our culture that pushes against and squeezes out the idea of friendship. You know, in Western culture, generally speaking, we prioritise and we put a very high value on romantic relationships. Who we're dating, who we're seeing, who we're going to get with, who we're going to marry, and on professional achievements. And so friendships increasingly get squeezed out. In Eastern culture, generally speaking, we put a huge amount of emphasis on our family relationships. We invest in our, you know, our closest blood relationships and on professional accomplishments. And again, if we're not careful, friendship can get squeezed out. You know, so when we're facing times of uncertainty and crisis and polarisation, when at this time in our cultural moment we most need friendships, the danger is, the risk is, that we have lost the skill of finding and forging them. A YouGov poll uh, in the UK said that 18% of men that they asked said they didn't have one close friend. It's actually a, a, a much less number uh, for women because generally women are more socially competent. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, actually 44% of people said that they often felt lonely. In the US over the last two decades, uh, there's been a threefold increase, three times increase in the number of people who say they have no one they can confide in. It's fascinating. As Jesus faces his greatest crisis, his greatest trial, he gathers his friends and he talks to them about friendship, his friendship with them. I've no longer called you servants, I call you friends. And their friendships with each other. As I've loved you, love one another. I had the privilege of spending a year with uh, David Ford, a professor uh, in Cambridge, who's, who spent all his life looking at John's Gospel. And one of the things he'd often talk about is what is the most significant word in John's Gospel? What sums up the whole of John's Gospel? And he had two of the options he often debated were kathos, as, as I have loved you, love one another but also friendship, you know, as and friendship. And both those concepts, both those words are found in these passages. You know, we often think of following Jesus as being a spiritual journey, our own private, personal matter. It's about me and Jesus. It's about my spiritual journey, my way of life, my pattern of life, you know, my rule of life, what I need to thrive spiritually. So our relationship with Jesus is primary and at best our relationship with other people is secondary, it's incidental, it's not as significant. But right here Jesus demonstrates with his example and with his teaching that friendship with him is inextricably linked with our friendship with other people. It overflows into our other relationships. Jesus says this awesome thing, I've called you friends. That means that every aspect of your relationship with God carries within it the characteristics of friendship. And that's so powerful when you think about your life, when you think about a spiritual journey, whether you've been following Jesus for five minutes or 50 years, because often it can feel a bit intimidating. Like, how do I actually pray? How, how, do, I, how do I know if I'm saying the right words about the right things at the right time in the right way? And what if I get it wrong? One of my friends, a guy called Pastor Agu, someone asked him, how, how do I pray, Pastor? He said, well, sit down with me here. He said, what's on your mind? And the guy said, well, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about this. And he's like, all right, and what else? He said, I'm a bit troubled about this. And oh, that's difficult, yeah, what else, what else? After about 10 minutes, he said, just in the way you've been talking to me, go and have that conversation with Jesus as a friend. 
It's, you can look at the Bible and think, well, it's complicated, there's lots of rules, it's complex, different languages, different you know, authors, different cultures, different things going on, different types of literature. How am I ever going to understand this? Or you can realize this is a letter written to you by a friend who knew you before one of your days came to be and loves you to the core of your being and wants you to thrive in your life. It's a letter from a friend. And Jesus isn't just a friend, but he's never less than a friend. He's interested. He's not too busy. He's always happy to spend time with you. And Jesus knows we need friends. As I've loved you, love one another. So not only is our relationship with God carrying all the characteristics of friendship, our friendships can carry the characteristics of God's love. Of all the things Jesus could have focused on at this key moment, He wants to strengthen the connections between his friends because he knows they're going to face opposition, challenge, criticism, accusation, condemnation, discouragement, disappointment. He knows they're going to face huge opportunities and extraordinary challenges. He knows it's going to be full on at times and in the crisis, they're going to need each other. Even at this moment, as the pressure grows, the cracks are forming. Judas walks out and Jesus' concern is that they might splinter, they might separate. You know, they, they might lose their friendship. The greatest danger in following Jesus is that you try and do it on your own. Is that you get split off. That you get isolated. You need some people with you. You can't be like a coal which is taken out of a fire. It gets cold very quickly. You need some people to run with you. Last Sunday, London Marathon, and I don't know if anyone here has ever run the London Marathon. Just give me a wave if you have. Oh, yeah, well done. And, uh, oh, lots, 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 loads of people. Very, very um, athletic service. And, uh, and, and I, I, I haven't run the London Marathon, but I used to go and cheer people on because we used to live like 20 metres from the route uh, on the highway. And so we'd walk down, and often our friends would be running, so we'd go and cheer them on. And they'd say the London Marathon is one of the most encouraging marathons to run because here's some photos. It's like six deep as you go around it. Um, there's people cheering you on the whole way. Often people write their names on their tops. And so, you know, my friend Will ran it, and like the whole way around, 26.3 miles, there's just people going, Will, keep going. And you feel like a million dollars, you're just running along. And like he hit a wall at about 20 miles, and even as he hit a wall, people go, you can do it don't stop now you're doing so well and just cheer you on it's almost like their encouragement their cheering on carries you further and faster I used to be and I am so impressed by people who've done a London Marathon just to be clear but now the bar's been raised because another of my friends did another marathon last week a marathon called the Marathon de Sable which is the Marathon of the Sands and it's almost the same just a little bit different you don't just do one marathon you do six marathons over uh, seven days and you don't do it in, in London you do it uh, in the Sahara Desert, um, in 40 degree heat, uh, in sand dunes, and you carry all your possessions on your back. So here's some photos of uh, that marathon, and um, you're just kind of running. It looks fun, doesn't it? And, uh, and you're running around, and, uh, and he actually managed to complete it. One of the days you have to do a double back-to-back marathon, um, pretty brutal, and you like stay in tents, and you just have to carry all your food on your back and your water on your back. So it's pretty brutal, a bit crazy. I don't know why he did it. He doesn't know why he did it, but he did it, and he completed it. And, uh, but he said, yeah, the blisters were hard. The 40 degree heat was brutal. Running in sand, he said, is awful. He said everything about it was miserable. He said, but the hardest thing by far was being completely on your own. So there are points whole hours of the day where you couldn't see another human being and you couldn't hear another voice. You could have heard a pin drop except for the sandstorms. Although actually there were photographers there, aren't there? So I don't know how they did. But, um, but I don't think they're very encouraging. And, uh, and he said, you just got no feedback. No one was saying, go on, Jeremy, well done. No one was cheering you on. And even when you finished, people didn't really have the energy to say you completed it. You know, the Christian life Following Jesus is a marathon, not a sprint. And you need people to run with you. John Wesley, uh, when he came to faith, um, not that far from here, um, someone who was older and wiser said to him, Sir, you wish to serve God and go to heaven. Remember, you cannot serve him alone. You must therefore find companions or make them. The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. You need friends. But the second thing we see here is Jesus empowers great friendships. 
It's this amazing thing that as we experience Jesus' love for us as a friend, it empowers our love for other people and enables us to forge great friendships in our lives. What I love about this, Jesus isn't naive about the realities of relationships. If you're more than 10 years old, you have probably experienced in your life friendships which you treasured falling apart. You've experienced a misunderstanding with a friend which has broken your heart. You've experienced a friend letting you down in a major way. You've experienced a friend which you thought would be there forever, suddenly growing cold and distance emerging. You might even have experienced a betrayal by a friend. At this meal, as Jesus teaches his disciples about friendship, even as he says the words, he is experiencing in real time a betrayal by one of his closest friends. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't talk about friendship or give up on friendship or back away on friendship or say, guys, some of you are going to be terrible. Don't, don't invest too much in this circle. Find a new one. He says, you've got to love each other as I've loved you. You've got to take the risk of finding and forging friendships full of love, even though it might break your heart at times. So interesting in life, because friendships can get a bit messy, because people are messy. People are complex. People mess up all the time. And what i found in life is that there are two movements normally in relationships. In my own heart, one is towards selfishness, which is kind of a downward spiral, where I, I rely on my needs, my rights, what I need. And the other is selflessness, where I'm thinking about the other person. That's more of an upward spiral. But the times in my life where I've been wrestling with things, maybe where I've been wrestling with sin, what I've noticed is that sin, it's relational. It affects relationships. But it's also spatial. It affects the distance between relationships. So the times in my life where I've been most wrestling with sin, I've been really tempted to put distance between myself and Jesus. I've been tempted to put distance between myself and the church. I've been tempted to put my distance between myself and my friends. Because I don't really want to be around them in case they judge me or in case they criticise me. Or because I know that they know because they know me. What I've been doing and where I've been. So interesting. Sin separates. It puts distance between you and other people. And, and here, Judas, he's happy to be a friend with Jesus until the cost outweighs the benefit. He's happy to be a friend until it gets in the way of his plans. He's happy to be a friend until he decides to save his own skin, cut a deal, and at this moment of great intimacy, betray Jesus and all his closest friends. If you've ever been betrayed by a friend, Jesus knows how that feels, and he's not surprised by it. And yet he says to you, as I've loved you, love one another. So how does that enable us to forge great friendships? Well, it gives you a humility. In life, when people mess up, it's tempting just to burn the friendship. And what I found in life is, is when I feel I'm doing really well, you know, I, I feel I can see other people's faults much more clearly. And so it's a sure sign to me now in life that when I notice people's faults really quickly, it's a sure sign I've lost sight of my own. And often I'm seeing what I'm denying, what I can't quite acknowledge in myself. And often that can get in the way of friendships. So I still remember 15 years ago being, I met this uh, a guy and, and we were kind of um, at, in, in a similar kind of group and, and we went to three things in a week. And one was like a dinner party or something. And I thought I quite liked this guy. I thought he might be a good friend. And then he said something at a dinner party. I thought, it's a bit arrogant. And um, went away thinking, I'm not sure I like that guy. And then there was like a drinks party. He had something I thought, it's a bit proud. I went away, I thought I didn't really like that guy. And then the third thing we were at, like an event, and he said something, I thought, that guy's just full of it. I thought, actually, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I really want to invest in that guy. And, uh, and so, but it still bothered me, like two days later, I remember thinking, why am I still bothered about this guy two days later? And I thought, maybe it's because I'm full of it. Maybe it's because I'm arrogant. Maybe it's because I'm proud. I suddenly realized I could see it so clearly in him because it was in me, but I hadn't acknowledged it in myself. And the Holy Spirit worked on my heart. And what happened was, I was able to look past the faults, because actually he was still a little bit proud. And, but, and 15 years later, he's one of my closest friends. But I almost burnt the relationship before it began because I thought I could see his faults so clearly and because I was blind to my own. And if you think you're perfect, no one's ever going to be good enough for you as a friend. But when you can come to Jesus and know the way he loves us, how do he love us? Sacrificially. 
He loves us wholeheartedly. He loves us unconditionally. And when you know that love, it means you can come to him, acknowledge, confess your sin, acknowledge, confess your faults. And that gives you a gentleness and a tenderness and a realism when you're assessing the faults of other people. It means friendships can form and they can last. So we have a humility, but it also gives us a shared passion. Best friendships, they're not static and passive. They're active and dynamic. So generally speaking, enemies face each other and they stand at a distance. Because if you've got an enemy in the room, you need to be a little bit vigilant. Where are they? Where are they moving? What are they doing? Don't want them to come behind you in case they stab you in the back. So enemies tend to stand at a distance and they face each other. They don't trust each other. Low trust. If people, people are kind of in a romantic relationship, they tend to stand really close and face each other because the relationship is all about each other. So there's lots of kind of like, I really like you. And the person, why do you like me? And they like, you're really beautiful. What else? You've got a great personality. What else? You're not like all the others. You know? and, um, and it's all about the relationship, constantly defining the relationship. Now, friendship is different. Very rarely do you go up to someone and say, I really like you. Please, can I be your friend? I think we'd be great friends. Uh, why do you want to be my friend? Oh, I just think you're really cool. You've got a good aesthetic. Are you like, you, it's like, it's, and they're like, okay. And like, no, no, I think we could be great friends. I'm sure we could. You know, they, they're kind of like backing away. It's like, and um, this other person would be a better friend for you. Definitely. And, you know, friendship isn't formed face to face, it's formed side by side. So friendships, they're not forced, they're found. They're not demanded, they're discovered. So generally, friendships are formed side by side. It's when you're with someone and you're doing something together, maybe it's sport, or maybe it's like you have a shared passion or a shared activity or a shared hope or a shared desire to see something come to pass. And as you stand together, you're looking at the same truth or the same beauty or the same hope or the same vision. And what happens as you're spending time together, this friendship just forges. Oh, we, we share this in common. Oh, you think the same. Oh, you struggle with that too. Oh, you hope for that too. Me too. And before you know it, a friendship has emerged in that space, side to side, looking at the same truth. And that's the amazing thing about our faith, is that it enables us to focus on the beauty of Jesus together, side by side, to, to long to see people come to know him, side by side together. It gives us a shared passion, which we can stand in together, and in which a friendship can forge. And I just want to tell you, the church should be the blessed place on the face of the earth to find and forge friends. The church should be the best place in the world to forge friendships. And I just want to acknowledge that has not been everyone's experience of the church. And I want to say to you, I am so sorry about that. Please forgive us. I know that at times it can feel a bit cliquey, like there's in crowds and out crowds, and it can feel a bit hard to connect. I'm so sorry. I long for the church and our church to be a place which is the easiest place in the world to find friends. You could move to a city, you could move to a church, and before you know it, you've got two or three great friends. I just want to say the church should be the best place on the face of the earth to be a single person. Should be a place that kind of like rejects this kind of cultural narrative that your value is found in relationships, romantic relationships with other people, and that all the emphasis should be that way should be a place where as a single person you feel valued and honoured and upheld and there's always a space at the table and there's always a space in the group and, and, and you just know that your value is just as much as anyone else's and that your friendships are just as valued as anyone else's. That's my longing, my prayer, my hope for us as a church and for the Capital C Church. And again, I'm sorry that it isn't always that way. The church should be the best place in the world to find and forge great friendships. And then the third thing we see is that when, when you know Jesus' love, you can help each other grow. Now, Jesus' love is, is secure, it's unconditional. And that means he could call his friends out, he could spur them on. He could, you know, Jesus gave feedback to his disciples. Sometimes it was quite tough, but they never doubted his love for them. And that sort of commitment enables a really significant friendship to grow. Because faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. You know, that sort of commitment enables growth, it enables creativity, it enables people to shield you and also to sharpen you. I love, this is a city that has changed the world through friendship. C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, great friends. J.R. Tolkien said of Lewis, he said, he was for long my only audience, 
Only from him did I ever get the idea that my stuff might be anything more than a private hobby. But for his interest and his unceasing eagerness for more, I would never have even begun to complete the Lord of the Rings. And when you have the security of a great friend calling out the gold in you, encouraging you, cheering you on, it enables amazing things to grow through collaboration and connection. And then the third thing we see in this passage is that the acid test of discipleship is friendship. Jesus says, by this, all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. It means that those who aren't yet following Jesus would see something in the quality of relationships between us and say, there is something different about them. They must be following Jesus. There's something about the way they live and they love. It almost shouldn't make sense unless Jesus is risen from the dead and they've encountered him. Like partly because of the depth of the relationships that people connect on a deeper level because there's a shared passion, a shared trust. But also it's the breadth. And through Jesus, we can forge great friendships with people that are very different from us, people from different political perspectives, people from different economic statuses, different ethnicities, different nationalities, different life experience. I love in this church that we have lawyers and prison leavers. We have academics and mechanics. We have baristas and barristers. We have entrepreneurs and people dedicated to conservation. We have teachers and students. And it surprises people. Like, what is it that's enabling this to happen? When we lived in uh, Tower Hamlets in East London, we took a whole load of young adults, youth away for a holiday. And uh, one of the guys uh, who came was this massive guy called Jamal. Like, he was 6'5", Stat. He looked like an NFL linebacker, just a massive guy. And, um, you know, he'd, he'd had quite a difficult life. He was known to police. And while we were away on this kind of church holiday, um, he got contacted, and it was the police saying, look, you've got to come back because uh, you've committed a criminal offence in Town Hamlets, and, and um, you're charged, and you've got to go to court. And I, he came off the court. He's like, oh, no, yeah, I've got to go back. I said, what's the problem? He said, oh, you know, I, I committed an offence, they say. And I said, oh, when? And he said, yesterday. I said, Jamal, you were here yesterday. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, but that means you can't be there. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what are you going to do? He's like, what can you do? They're not going to believe me. I was like, this stage, I was a criminal defense barrister. I was like, over my dead body, are you going to court on your own and just going to kind of wear this? I said, I'll come with you. So we go to court together and we walk in. And um, you know, I had to take the, um, the morning off my actual job, which was to go to court, to go to court. And, uh, and so we walk in and he's there massive, hooded up. And, uh, and there's me kind of little in my suit. And we walk in together and we go up to the court and he comes up to the, uh, the prosecutor and the policeman and he says, oh, actually, I, I wasn't there, so I need to say I wasn't there. And they're like, where were you? He was like, I was in the countryside. And they're like, where in the countryside? He was like, I don't know. And I was like, oh, it's not good. And, uh, and, then, and then I stepped forward and I said, so sorry, can I help? And, and the, the prosecutor said, are you his barrister? And I was like, no, I'm his friend. And he was like, what? And I could see him like look down at me and look up at Jamal. And he was like, what, what, what? And I was like, we're friends. He's like, where, how, where are you friends? And I said, we go to the same church. He was like, oh. And he said, why are you here? And I was like, because I'm an alibi witness. He was with me when this offense took place. He said, no, he wasn't. We've got an eyewitness that he was in Tahamis. I said, I'm the eyewitness. He was with me. He wasn't there. He said, would you testify to that? I was like, yes, just give me that chance. <laughs> and anyway, we did it, and he was acquitted, and da, da, da. I was like, don't you dare prosecute my friend again. <laughs> anyway, unless he's done it. But, um, <laughs> but we should forge friendships in the church which are radical, which surprise people, which make people think there's something different going on here. And I love this. Jesus says, by this, all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. By this, all people. What does all people include? It includes you. Sometimes people say to me, how can I know that I'm a follower of Jesus? How can I know that, I, that I'm a disciple? Here Jesus says the acid test of discipleship is not the extent of your knowledge, it's the depth of your love. The acid test of discipleship is friendship. I would go so far as to say it's almost impossible to be following Jesus closely and loving other people less. It's very easy to have good ideas about what church should be. 
It's very easy to project your ideas onto church and say, oh, this church is very good. That's, it should be more like, this, more like that. It's very easy to have a view of what the church should be and love that view more than you love the people in the church. It's very easy to come to church and, 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 and say what the church should deliver for you and, and love the idea of what the church should deliver for you more than you love the church. It's very easy to love the idea of community even more than you love the people in the church. I just want to encourage you. Jesus says, love one another in the same way that I've loved you, sacrificially, unconditionally, wholeheartedly, with your whole self. I love about this church that people come here and they're excited to be here and they're not saying, oh, I just want to come because it gives me this, it gives me that. I want to come because I love the people in this place so much. Though they're different from me, though they're complex at times, though there's lots that might not be the way I want it to be, though lots about this church isn't my preference, I'm desperate to see God's purposes worked out in the lives of the people in this church. And I'm going to come and ask each week, how can I bless people? I want to see how they're doing. I want to encourage that person. I want to cheer on that person. I want to see how that thing went that they're struggling with. I want to support them. The acid test of discipleship is in friendship. I would encourage you, never make your life just about your life. Never make your relationships just about your relationships. Never make your friendships just about your friendships. Never make your friendship circle just about your friendship circle. Never make your family just about your family. Never make your church just about your church. Life grows in proportion to the extent to which you give it away. The disciples here could have said, well, we're down to 11. It's a bit tricky out there. Up the drawbridge, up the walls. Let's just spend the next five years really thinking about Jesus' teaching, making sure we've nailed it, we've understood it, just reciting it between us 11, and when we've absolutely nailed it, maybe we'll go and help another person. We'll be like the Marines of discipleship. No. They were called together as friends to give their lives away for other people. They were forged together as friends by Jesus, not for their own sake, but for the sake of others, to lay down their lives in helping other people find and follow him. And the more that you see that Jesus came, not just to save you from something, but to win you for something, to make you into his friend, he didn't just save you from something, he, he saved you for friendship. Jesus was with relationship with the Father and the Spirit from before all time. And yet he came to win you as his friend. And when you see that, when you realise that, it does something in your heart. It electrifies your soul. It kind of frees you to, to, to go into the whole area of friendship again without fear, full of hope, risking the disappointment, you know, the risk of failure, the betrayal that might come. No, whatever it takes, I'm not going to give up on this in my life. Holy Spirit, would you show me to the people who need my friendship? Would you show me how I can be a great friend to the people around me? Lord, would you position me in such a way that there are divine connections for your purposes? And Jesus, would your friendship with me, the fact that I'm your friend, so saturate my heart that it overflows into the people around me. In Jesus' name, amen.